Um, as I understand it, um, I've got two tasks. One is to say something about the, this workshop and this issue of the journal as a whole, and then to say a few words about this first session. Is that right? 15 minutes, so I better get going. So first of all, um, and you know, do correct me if I, I say things that you don't think this is about. I think this is a very uh, important workshop. Um, the theme, let me just speak for, I suppose, about seven minutes. Critical dialogues, dialogue, and conflict resolution. That's the title of this workshop. And it relates to this special issue of the journal, Critical Dialogues, Dialogue and Conflict Resolution. So I'll just say a very few words about those key phrases, dialogue, conflict resolution, and critical dialogue studies. Now, dialogue, I need hardly say anything here, in the heart of the Dialogue Society, which has been doing all this marvellous work we've been seeing. Um, as I understand it, the Dialogue Society definition of dialogue, roughly, <laughs> is meaningful linguistic interaction between people across differences with a view to increasing human understanding. I would myself add, and enabling communicative action, the Habermas dimension. Um, now, I think this is clearly of absolutely central importance in human relations of all kinds, within societies and across societies, that dialogue is as, whole, as old as human language. It does not begin with soliloquy. It begins with dialogue. And we are constituted, all of us, in our societies mm -hmm. through language, which is dialogic. Mm -hmm. So it's an absolutely, the theme of this society is fundamental. Now, the second thing is conflict resolution. I understand that the, I thought I'd taken this out of, here they are. Um, this workshop is related to these publications by the Society, Dialogue Theories 1 and 2. 25 contributors, some of whom are practitioners thinking out the theory, some of whom are taking great theorists, philosophers like Wittgenstein, and saying, how does this relate to dialogue? Mm -hmm. Um, these contributions here are both analytic and normative. I'd like to focus for a one moment on the normative dimension, if you like, the ethics of this. The aim of this, it has an ethical purpose, which I think was explained in what we've just seen together. The ethical purpose is to spread awareness of how dialogic approaches of all these different kinds can give hope in our contemporary world of generating greater intercultural understanding between us, increasing our collective capacity to tackle superordinate ecological and other goals, that's the action side of it, and of course, finding better ways of handling political differences at all levels non-violently. We will always have conflict. I don't think the aim is to remove conflict, nor should it be. The aim is to transform actually or potentially violent conflict into non-violent processes of change, understanding, growth, etc. Now, I conclude this first part, and I hope, Chair, that I'm keeping to my time, with this idea of critical dialogue studies. Now, from this came the idea that it would be a very good idea for the society to look critically at dialogic approaches to conflict. In particular, actually to single out the most difficult conflicts where these approaches find it hardest to get purchased. I will even use words like failure of conflict resolution, um, intractable conflict. Now, I would always say, as yet, so far intractable conflict. The aim is, the aim of um, critical dialogue studies is to look at those hard cases to find out why these approaches do not yet work in order to improve them. I would say that is not negative and it is not defeatist. On the contrary, it is the best way to evolve this whole complex of methodologies and approaches and understandings that is called dialogue. So look at, if you like, where it's hardest. And I think that is the essence. Um, so I would sum it up. I've written here, um, in the light of this, existing approaches may need to be adapted 
prior processes may need to be put in place before these approaches become applicable. You may have to do something to get the situation ready for these to work, and you can identify those. And, of course, you can combine them, because some of them may be good in this circumstance, some in that circumstance. And I think we can all confess an occupational hazard because we are passionately concerned about our own methodology. We tend to say, this is brilliant, this methodology. It works here, it works there, especially when you're looking for funding. <laughs> you're not going to get a fund set. Of course, this doesn't work a lot. Could you give me some money? So you have to... But in critical dialogue study, you can think which bits work and put them together in a more creative way. Now, if I've got time, Chair, I will now come on... If that is that all right for introducing the workshop? <clears throat> yes? Mm -hmm. Thumbs up from... OK. Now, what about this session, which is called Intercultural Dialogue and Conflict? Vast theme for... Perhaps have I got five more minutes? We do indeed, yes. <laughs> OK. Now, this has from the beginning been central in dialogue studies in relation to conflict resolution intercultural dialogue and conflict. Now, I'm going to make a slight apology at the beginning of my five minutes, because I'm going to talk about quite a high level of intercultural conflict. Whereas I think the most important work is done not at that level, it's done locally. What we saw, all those activities are the foundation. They are where it hits people's lives, that's where it counts. But if you'll excuse me, I will say something at a kind of more general level. Now, in my experience, do a little historical two-minute survey, through to the 1970s, the big story was handling through dialogue ideological conflict linked to the Cold War. That was the big issue. There was also a big concentration on using dialogic <laughs> methods to prevent or alleviate an upsurge of ethno-nationalist conflicts which followed in the wake of decolonization mm. because the number of states were very small, first 50, now 200 roughly, and the number of peoples is enormous. So you've got huge cross-cultural... Um, interestingly at that time, in my view, big generalization, in the religious sphere, it was really ecumenicism that was the thing. In my sphere of conflict analysis, Amazingly, through to the 70s, it wasn't a huge topic into religious conflict. It was thought, it was always translation to socioeconomic terms. It's, it's amazing when you look back at it. Um, now, this changed, and I'm not going on too long. The collapse of the Soviet Union was a kind of catalyst here. In the 90s, first of all, you got the extraordinary idea of Francis Fukuyama. This was the end of history because there was only one dominant ideology left. I don't think so. He's still getting huge sums of money as a pundit <laughs> when he's been absolutely wrong on the biggest thing he said, which made his name. So I suggest we all become pundits. It doesn't matter whether your predictions are right or wrong. You simply read it backwards and collect your next paycheck. So that's a bit unfair on him, but we don't mind. He's making a lot of money. Um, now, this was immediately challenged by younger people don't remember the impact of Samuel Huntington, mm. clash of civilizations. He said after the Cold War, what's coming is a clash of civilizations. He had seven civilizations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was a pretty good thesis. His original article had a question mark, clash of civilizations. When he wrote his book, he removed the question mark. Um, anyway, this, in counter to this, came a tremendous counter reaction, which was, we will have a dialogue of civilizations. And this became a UN central, together with the other millennial goals of the UN, a dialogue. Now, there are many kinds of dialogue. I will conclude by contrasting two of them. One was Hans Kuhn's Parliament of the World Religions. The idea there was that the great civilizations already agree on fundamental principles. <clears throat> the other is my favorite, which I've made a contribution here on, Hans Kuhn's um, Gadamer's hermeneutic approach, where you have to work for this. You have to realize uh, where your own prejudice for Thailand are. This is your horizon. Then there's another horizon. And you're not trying to push your horizon. You're not even trying to sympathize with the other horizon. You are creating a, a fusion of horizons. 
And this is a kind of third, it's kind of Hegelian idea, very creative. Um, I think it's a tremendous idea, and it's very difficult to do, and it's ongoing. You never come to a point where you've always, there's another horizon, and another horizon, and another horizon. You have to train yourself as a hermeneuticist to be aware of where you've reached a limit, and, that, and, and somehow learn, and <clears throat> five minutes, that's, I won't need that long. <laughs> Thank you. So there's that. Now there are other, um, I'll just mention, if I've got just one more at this top level, in the kind of ethno-national world, one of the great things, which I'm sure the society is very interested in, is um, national dialogues, where you get together after a, in a war-torn country, you get together representatives of all the different, in order to have a national dialogue to give you the background for having a constitution where you can do what we were told at the end there, the, the, the democratic. I mean, democracy is a way of handling conflict, isn't it? It's, it's not, and there are all sorts of, and core to it is dialogue. So those national dialogues are also of great global significance. Um, finally, my final sentence really is that given this tremendous task for dialogue, um, it is not surprising coming to the critical dialogue studies that in the most difficult cases so far, mm. these approaches often do not work. And I'm ending with the perhaps the most spectacular example of this, which was just when you had the millennial goals, just when you had the millennial dialogue of civilizations, and you reach the year 2000, hooray, we've entered a new millennium, this is going to be wonderful, we're going to solve all our problems. On the 11th of September 2001 came the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And this shook to the core a lot of the, what had gone wrong? What, what's going on here? And then you move on to what's happened since, which I won't. And I can actually come back to that theme and pick it up in the next session when I'm going to. So that's all at the top level. I'm very aware of that. And a number of what we're doing in our papers here are at the cutting edge at other levels. But my really final mm. sentences, I think I'd like to thank the organizers and the society for bringing us here for doing all the hard work of bringing together this journal. I think it's a strand of the society's work, critical conflict studies, that I hope will go on. Mm. The society will go on being critical in this creative way, ask difficult questions of us all, and in that way get us to develop and make these approaches increasingly relevant in some of the most difficult cases where at the moment they face um, difficulties. So that's it.